In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And that is all entirely inaccurate. Unless you believe the universe is only 10,000 years old, then whether God exists or not doesn't change the fact that there was light in the universe for billions of years before the Earth even formed. And if there hadn't been light, there wouldn't have been any liquid water on the surface of the planet to hover over. Now, no, we're not to poke holes in Genesis. Phil Collins did that all by himself. But what we do want to do is go back to the very beginning. Even further back, to before the Earth was formed. Let's go all the way back to the year 13.7 billion BC, give or take. To the moment when the Big Bang took place. The Big Bang created all of the matter in the universe, but it also created something else. It created something that you could never physically hold, but is worth 3,000 times more than all the gold on Earth. We are, of course, talking about love. No, we're talking about antimatter. This is the science of science fiction, isn't it? The Big Bang should have created equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Why it didn't is one of the biggest mysteries of our era. But it clearly could not have, because when matter and antimatter collide, they annihilate one another, releasing huge amounts of energy. If there would have been equal amounts of both, then everything in the universe should have been well, well and truly annihilated. Scientists hear that statement and they see it as a giant cosmic puzzle. How could the universe, as we know it, have come into being? It's an open question, and it's one with a lot of interesting theories that we're not going to get into today. Because while what scientists said was a complex mystery, world leaders don't have that sort of attention span. They only heard about every 20th word of that statement, so the only thing that picked up in their brains was antimatter could annihilate everything. And it's true, antimatter weapons would be the most devastating weapons that the world has ever seen, but is this a real threat or is it just a ridiculous pipe dream? Let's find out! How dangerous is antimatter? As with most things, the danger level of antimatter is a question of scale. Antimatter is produced in nature all the time. There could even be an antimatter particle in your house right now, oh no! But look, if there was, it's already gone. Antimatter isn't actually that uncommon. I mean, take bananas, for example. Bananas contain potassium-40, a very slightly radioactive isotope of potassium. As these atoms decay, they produce one positron every 75 minutes or so, and they are annihilated within a nanosecond of being produced when they collide with an ambient electron. And if we didn't tell you any of this, you probably uh, wouldn't have ever known it happened. So to weaponize antimatter, it's clearly going to take more than just a single particle. Now, at this point, we should probably define what antimatter actually is and make sure that everybody is on the same page. You're welcome. Antimatter is basically just the opposite of regular matter. Instead of negatively charged electrons, you have positively charged positrons. Instead of positively charged positrons, you have negatively charged antiprotons. And instead of nice, lawful, neutral neutrons, you have chaotic, neutral, antineutrons. Okay, that last part we totally made up. They both just have a boring neutral charge but that's not very interesting. But really, the thing is, to explain the difference between neutrons and antineutrons, we'd need to start talking about quarks and baryon numbers, and no, nobody cares. <laughs> When you describe it like that, it's pretty simple. I now assume you understand. So, getting back on track, a single antimatter particle isn't going to do anything. But how much does it take to cause some serious damage? The answer is actually very little. The atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki contained a payload of 6.4 kilograms of plutonium and had a blast of 21 kilotons. The same amount of energy would be released by the detonation of one half gram of antimatter. Now, there are a couple of important things to note here. First, not all 6.4 kilograms of the core of Fat Man underwent nuclear fission. But even with that caveat, the annihilation of antimatter and matter produces 300 times as much energy as the nuclear fission or fusion of the same amount of material. Unlike either of those processes, Antimatter releases energy with 100% efficiency since energy is the only byproduct of the reaction. Now, look, weapons have come a long way since World War II, and uh, we no longer measure nuclear explosions in kilotons. The largest weapon ever detonated was the Tsar bomber, with a blast yield of over 50 megatons. It was designed to be able to produce a 100 megaton blast, but the test was scaled down due to concerns about the amount of radiation it would produce, as well as the inability of a pilot to actually get far enough away from the explosion in time to 
survive. This remains the most destructive weapon the world has ever seen, and the same effect could be produced with only 1.1 kilograms of antimatter. In terms of pure explosive force, there is likely nothing in the universe that could compare to the power of antimatter. And ironically, these explosions would actually be safer than nuclear weapons. The bomb dropped on Nagasaki resulted in 60 to 80,000 deaths, not counting all of the long-term consequences of the fallout. Antimatter weapons don't produce radiation the way that nuclear fission does, meaning that only the blast itself would be dangerous. If a military had access to antimatter weapons, not only would they likely be the most powerful weapons the world has ever seen, but they'd probably be willing to use them. Without the fear of fallout radiation and the effects it would have on the environments, then why not deploy antimatter weapons as long as your targets were military bases that were far enough away from civilians, an antimatter bomb would be a great way to take out an entire base in one strike without unnecessary collateral damage or causing, you know, a nuclear winter. Between the incredibly high blast yields created by very small amounts of antimatter and the lack of radiation, antimatter weapons would absolutely be a huge threat. They would be the most incredible advancement in warfare since drones, and we already know that antimatter can and has been created in labs, so, well, are these weapons an imminent threat? Right. And the answer there is absolutely no chance. Like we said, antimatter has already been created in labs, and we already know its destructive properties. And you can bet your ass that every major military power has already put their best scientists to work researching the possibility of building antimatter weapons. Fortunately, we aren't in the middle of an antimatter cold war right now, and for one very simple reason. These weapons are a stupid idea. That's not to say that any weapons of mass destruction are necessarily a good idea, but there is a strategic reason that militaries would want to have nuclear weapons. Antimatter weapons, on the other hand, are the world's most expensive form of suicide and or friendly fire. It's true that antimatter particles have been made in labs, but it's not really very easy to do. Even more difficult than creating antimatter is storing antimatter. I mean, where are you actually planning on keeping this shit? It can't touch anything or it will annihilate. We couldn't even store it in the empty void of space because it isn't actually empty enough. There's roughly one particle in every cubic meter of empty space, so eventually any matter would be annihilated. However, there is a solution known as a penning trap. This is a device that uses a combination of electric and magnetic fields to hold the particles in place. While it has been successfully used to hold particles, and CERN holds the record for holding an antiproton in a penning trap for 405 days, the process doesn't scale well. You simply couldn't store large amounts of material in this way. Even if we found a way to store larger amounts, it needs to be absolutely foolproof. There is one very simple rule when it comes to bombs. The things should not go boom before you want them to. An antimatter bomb would need a massive power supply in order to contain the antimatter, and it could never fail. Losing power for even a fraction of a second would be enough to detonate the bomb. They would simply be too risky to manufacture and too risky to store, as the possibility of an accidental detonation would just be extremely high. But really, who's that gonna stop? Scientists kill themselves all the time doing stupid sh** when they should have known better. I mean, okay, maybe not all the time, but it still happens often enough. The Demon Corps claimed the lives of multiple scientists performing separate irresponsible experiments, so surely someone would want to try and make a bomb capable of safely delivering a payload of antimatter to a target location. Militaries would be inclined to pay them to do so as well, so well, what's really standing in our way? And as with all things, the answer is predictably money. We mentioned earlier that only half a gram of antimatter could create an explosion the same size as the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. So how expensive is a gram of antimatter? Well, as of 2019, the cost of one gram of antimatter was over $2.5 quadrillion. To give that some perspective, the cost of one gram of antimatter is equivalent to the entire world's GDP for roughly 25 years. Alternatively, if you were to take every single penny of every currency in the entire world right now, you'd only be able to create about a one five hundredth of a gram of antimatter. Fortunately, it's not like you'd be paying that entire thing up front. To date, only a few nanograms of antimatter have been produced 
produced in total worldwide. At current production rates, it would take something on the order of tens of millions of years to actually produce an entire gram of it. These numbers are all comical in nature, and there's just no way that any sort of antimatter weapon would be realistic. Even the United States military isn't going to go near something that expensive. The entire Manhattan Project to develop the world's first atomic bombs only cost about $33 billion in today's money. That's about one millionth of what a project to create antimatter weapons would cost. There's just no way that these things are going to exist. Wrap up. If antimatter weapons existed, they would be a major threat. They could have far more destructive power than nuclear weapons, but without all of that nasty fallout that everyone just hates. This means that militaries would be a lot less reserved in deploying such weapons. But again, that's if they existed. The reality is that it's just not going to happen. It would cost all of the money, and it would take millions of years just to create a single antimatter bomb. And that's assuming everything just went perfectly according to plan, which it would now look, people are looking for workarounds to make the weapons more realistic, but the solutions honestly cause more problems than they create. One popular suggestion is antimatter bullets rather than antimatter bombs. The theory behind this idea is that you'd need far less antimatter for a bullet, but that's about the only part of it that makes sense. An antimatter bullet would be far more destructive than necessary, and you'd still need a way to store the antimatter. Having a bullet that requires a massive amount of electricity at all times, including while it's chambered in the gun to the point of reaching its target, is just well, it's silly. Of course, there's always the chance that future technology will make this all much more plausible. According to a study from the Rand Corporation, while under contract from the US Air Force, there should be the ability to produce 10 trillion antiprotons per second, as well as transportable antiproton reservoirs within the next five to seven years. That is heralding some incredible progress that would make antimatter weapons far more realistic. But since the paper in question was published back in 1985, it's probably safe to say that their estimations were just a tiny bit optimistic. Besides, we have better things to do with antimatter than try to build weapons anyway. Antimatter could be used as a source of power or a form of propulsion. If antimatter annihilation could be performed in a controlled way, it would be far more efficient and far more powerful than any rocket fuel we could ever develop. And if anything went wrong, antimatter explosions happen so quickly that the crew wouldn't feel a thing, which is nice.